report, we have the privilege of presenting the award for the man that we consider was the fairest and best in yesterday's All-Ireland final, Tom Prendergast of Kerry. Tom, we present you with this, and may I congratulate you on receiving this award, which I feel is very well deserved. Tom, uh, yesterday's game, towards the end of the second half, Mead going great guns, cutting down the scores, and you just three points ahead. What did you think? I thought that we'd have a pretty tough fight in our hands at that stage, Michal. They were pressing, and they had been pressing for about five or ten minutes before that, and I thought that, you know, it would be touch and go. That's what it. did you think was the turning point? Oh, the turning point, really, I suppose, was DJ Crowley's goal. Once that came, well, I was sure that we were home and dry, like... DJ, that goal, that goal that made all the difference, would you tell us about it? And for example, when you started to run, did you think you were going to go the whole way? Well, Michal, I got a pass from uh, John O'Keefe at uh, centre field and I was on my own, so I just ran with the ball and soloed and things just developed. Uh, I passed one man and Brendan Lynch threw out his uh, the corner back, which left Jack Quinn and myself inside. And I just soloed up a side of Jack Quinn and kicked the ball around to it with my right foot and it swung across in front of the goalie. Now it sounds very simple the way you tell it, you just had Jack Quinn in front of you and we all know that that's a mighty thing to have in front of you. Did Even when you saw Jack, did you decide to go on and belt it yourself? Well I, I suppose I did. Uh, I, I've if you, I've done this a couple of times in training I, I, and well Paolo Dunhu knows what, what I do about swinging the ball uh, around him and he can put out his foot but if a back doesn't on, uh, does know about this thing uh, he very rarely will he be able to block a low shot if you're swinging around to right leg around him and there's a lot of luck attached to it too Donny Sullivan captain of the victorious Kerry team congratulations Donny looking at the match yesterday I felt that it was a match in which Meath were on top for long spells Kerry were on top for long spells would you agree with that? well I, I think Michal that the 80 minutes makes for that uh, you can dominate the game for maybe 30 minutes the most you can expect is to have a hole in the game maybe 15 and then the opposition have to go, come along and get become dominant again for a while well me seem to get dominant uh, towards the end of the second half well i think from the middle of about the middle of the second half on maybe five minutes or six from the end then carry came again but uh, i thought that meat were flat out at that stage and I didn't think they could stick it maybe to the end. Uh, and they didn't? They didn't. No. Uh, Donny, you were the captain of the team. You had to go off with an injury. How are you, by the way? Well, it, it's not too bad, but I'm going to be out for a few weeks anyhow. Oh, dear. Yeah. Well, uh, can we ask you that as the captain looking at the match from the sideline, uh, how did you feel when Meade were picking off these points? I didn't feel too well. I thought they were coming very strong. And I thought it would be touch and go at that stage. Well, where did you think the strength of Kerry? Where, where did you think that the strong point of Kerry, the point that was going to tell in your favour was? Well, when Meath were on completely in top of midfield, uh, that's the, I, was, I knew that the forwards, once they got the ball down, that there was, there was another score in them, or a few scores, because they have, both wing forwards were playing well, and then the, full, the whole full, full forward line seemed to be on top of that stage. You mentioned a few moments ago the 80 minutes. Now, you've played the 80 minutes. Yesterday, as captain, you played a good deal of the 80 minutes. You looked at the rest of the game. What did you think of this 80 minutes? Well, uh, so far, it, is, it has suited Kerry. But uh, well, outside of suiting yeah, Kerry yeah. now, Dolly, what do you think of it for the game? I think it's a good thing. But uh, I thought maybe if they started off with 35 minutes for each half, and then they may have, could have gone to 40 the following year. Next to Loch Scornock near Kinmair can be nice if you have a telephone. Living and running a business there can be one big headache if you don't. Frank Moynihan has this problem. Frank, Pigeon Post is no longer with us. What made you try this idea? Well, when you live in a place like this where there isn't any telephone service, you have to come up with something to make communication with your nearest town. I see. And what's it like living here and working here without a telephone? Trying to run a business and living here without a telephone is extremely difficult. For the simple reason being that uh, to anybody it can happen that you can run out of food, you can run out of anything during the day. And if you could make contact with Killarney or with Kenmay or any of the two towns, there would be somebody passing, the usual people like the postman or somebody is always passing, they would be able to bring the stuff to you. And this would make my job much easier here if I could make some form of communication with any of those two towns. Well, how hard did you really try to get a telephone? Well, in 1968, when we bought this pub, I applied to the Department of Post and Telegraphs for, a, for a, um, a, a telephone, and they said that it would cost something in the region of 35 to 40,000 pounds to bring a telephone over the mountains here. 
I see. And is this more than your premises is worth? Well, I think the premises would be sold for about £45,000. OK, and now you're going, you're going into this harebrained idea, pigeon post. Uh, yes, well, the thing is, I know uh, this has been tried in England very, very successfully because uh, sometime last year a gentleman came in here looking for to use my telephone and when I told him he didn't have any, he then told me that he actually rears pigeons, homing pigeons, that will carry messages from point A to point B. So we discussed it at length and I decided that I would give it a try and that I would take one of the pigeons from him. The cost of the pigeon will be £35 delivered here to me and uh, I can send uh, that pigeon from here to Killarney and he will take any message from me and bring back a message as well. Frank, are you really serious about this? Oh, I am very serious. I am. Actually, if you like to come down here next February, I'll show you the pigeon in action. Well, what are you going to do once you have the pigeon here? Well, it's easy. It's, I, I believe it's easy to train him uh, because all I have to do is put him in my car, take him down to Addo Heights Hotel, which is our associate company, and uh, let him familiarise himself with the area there, bring him back up here again, and after a few excursions like this, he'll be able to make it off on his own. There are many facets of the flat, Joel. This is one, the tent town in Listowel Town Park, with an estimated 20,000 people to be accommodated. Hotels and guest houses are booked out for miles around and the Stoll Town Park has become a temporary home for hundreds. The impromptu music sessions on the streets are another facet. Leading traditional musicians and some less qualified perform while waiting to compete in the formal side of the flower. And for the stall, the flour is a boom time. Two chartered flights have brought in visitors from Chicago and New York, and there are representatives from 26 coldest Kyoltori air and branches in Britain. There are among 2,000 competitors seeking All Ireland titles, the serious side of the flour. <laughs> The major interest has been created here by La Rosa Muraku, president of the organizing group Coltis Tori Erin. He called for a government conference to promote Irish culture. Farming organizations and trade unions would take part, as well as state agencies. Is this practical? I am certain of this because uh, I do believe it's a bad thing in a way that the culture of Ireland, we're talking about the language, the music, etc., has become identifiable with, say, with just small groups of people. This is necessary, of course, from a promotional point of view, but I think it's essential to bring home that the culture of Ireland belongs to the whole community. And I have no doubt in my mind but that the people in other organizations as individuals are very interested in promoting native culture as well. So what I would hope is that if we can bring the leaders of these bodies or nominated representatives to a conference, we can find where the common ground and the common concern exists. <laughs>
to the business of characters. Is it essential to you and writers, Listowel writers, that you have these characters here? They are convenient. In fact, I think I, you, you could. There are hundreds of them here. Well, I've met one or two. We've met you. one or two. You met a man once with me who, who, when we asked him to imitate a polar bear, he did so. He said, <laughs> and we asked him to do it south, and he said, <laughs> well, where would you, where would you get responses like these? So, the so we cultivate them, we encourage them to be funny yes. and to be themselves. But another thing about the tone, which is very significant, I think, that it will not tolerate any kind of pomposity or bombast or snobbery. And those who uh, are not aware of this and who tend to be snobbers are shot down very quickly. Mm. It just doesn't exist here. L the still writers, by and large, JB, tend to stay here. I mean, tend to live in Ireland at the, at the moment, if yes. not around Listowel, uh, certainly here in Ireland. One thinks yes. of yourself, McMahon, uh, Kenley, the two Kenleys yes. and so on like that. Uh, is this essential for your writing? It is essential, I, I would say, it's, but we all have been away from home, you see, for quite long periods. Mm. Kenley spent years in England as I did. Uh, Brian McMahon was in America. Uh, the thing is that, that uh, you're near your roots. Your material is all around you, and you have the training already. There's no need to go abroad. And remember that many of the writers who went abroad to England did so because of, of what they believed to be was religious persecution. Oh, Casey, for instance. Yes, but this is a liberal age, and... and, and uh, if, 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 I, I don't ever remember religious persecution in this town, they just wouldn't stand for it, the people here. But it, the, the Ireland of today is a far different Ireland from, from the bigoted Ireland, we'd say, of the 30s, when they banned Terry Flynn, when they banned Walter Mackin's book, Quench the Moon. God almighty, these were a backward, bigoted, mm. primitive sort of, of, of uh, it was a bigoted censorship. But that's gone today. Not every writer who was born in Listowel made a rich living out of writing. Do the Listowel men of today make a living from their works at all? No, not purely from, from books or from plays. You can have successes as I have, but not every writer has a box office success. Uh, it is possible to make a living if you write for newspapers, and newspapers in Ireland pay very well, provided you give them the sort of stuff they want. They expect pretty high standards, and they expect you to be consistent, and if you're prepared to do this, they give you a decent wage. But from trying to make a living uh, from plays themselves or from books, say, you can accept myself with regard to plays because I'm, I'm lucky enough to have popular plays. Uh, it, I doubt if it's possible to make a, a full-time living uh, as a writer. But is it possible, Brian, for the writer to make his living in Ireland? Now, what I mean is this. You are also a schoolmaster. Would it be possible for you to live off your earnings as a writer? I think that you can do it now, but not by Irish sales alone. You, you'll have to have a publication abroad in America, possibly Britain and Australia and so forth and so on. But it's just about possible. I think the concession to, for income tax was, was, was absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I wrote and all I got for payment for school teaching was ten pence a week. I got three and six, but ten pence halfpenny for a month's work because the rest was taken off me by income tax. But it's just about possible now. Would you agree then with O'Casey, who for instance has said that uh, he couldn't live in Ireland because of this closed-in feeling. You know, some people use that as a, as a that self-flagellation, beating themselves as a motive power for writing. I think everybody has his own motive power. Somebody can stand the, the tensions and the pressures. It's in a small town, obviously. It's in a small town. But it can be a very wonderful thing. It can, when you're down, they'll pull you up. When you're up, they'll, they'll, they'll just tone you down a little bit for fear you'd you get a bit too high, but it's a very lovely thing. They watch you all the time, to some extent. Yeah, everybody then. watches everybody in a small place. That's, there isn't much to see in a small town, but what you hear makes up for it. Well, what, John, are, are your working methods? Do you get up every morning at 8 o'clock, sit at a typewriter, compose no, for an hour or so? My wife gets up every morning at 8 o'clock. I, uh, I, uh, I work consistently. I, I write regularly for two newspapers, the Limerick Leader and the Herald, and uh, then Every so I, I'm always thinking about a play. I think non-stop. I'm thinking about a play at this present time, which I won't write for about a year, because it just won't come out. But the writing then is, is, is child's play. It's a relief. I could write it in three or four weeks. But it's, it's the building up beforehand, like, you know? Mm. Sort, sort of uh, having enough material inside. Well, what's your day? I mean, do you...? My day consists of getting up in the morning, uh, probably read the papers, then I'd write for about an hour and a half, say from half ten to twelve. Then I come up here to this field and I, I look after these trees that 
I, I started to plant lately. <coughs> and I often run a mile or a mile and a half to keep fit. Most times I do that. But is it a good thing for Le Stoll to have a festival of writers at all? Well, uh, you know, I'm a bit cheery of the word festival. Everybody is. There are too many festivals in this country. But I think it'll, be all, I think it'll go very well indeed. Uh, we have some little thing here of our own. It isn't artificial. It isn't imposed on us. It's something of our own. And we think... I, I taught in creative writing schools in America, and while I believe firmly that a writer cannot be made or manufactured, I, I think he can be stimulated into life, and it's our hope here that some young fellow will come along and that we possibly can, can stimulate him into doing something. If he looks around at people in this town and says, well, if these fellows can write, surely to goodness, I can do it too. Well, I don't know how it's being held, I suppose, except if you like it, it, it it's, could be a shop window for the works of local writers. It, it could be a good thing for local guest houses and pubs. There's no question about this. It probably will be. And I know of at least seven, uh, I won't call them companions of mine, who are what I would call well-qualified boozers. <laughs> I, I hope these won't be in a preponderance. I, they probably won't, but I know that many of the clients come and are well able to take their drop. On the other hand, it will be very interesting to hear what outsiders think of local writers, because there will be a series of lectures and talks on the works and, 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 and on the characters of um, authors who, were, who, who lived here and who live here now. It will be interesting to see all this. How it's going to turn out, I haven't the faintest idea. But uh, obviously, for the town which has absorbed the flak here on the Hearn and, and the store races repeatedly, I don't think it will present any problems to the town. I think the townspeople will take this in their stride. They've put up with the store writers know for many years, patiently and tolerantly. And I'm sure they'll put up with those who come to do them homage or to criticise them. Well, I have got no direct invitation to take part in it yet, except from uh, John V, <laughs> who uh, I'm inclined to believe would issue invitations to anybody that's good enough to have a few jazz with him. Uh, I'd be slightly doubtful of it, you know. I think it's a bit dangerous because uh, it smacks to me a little bit of putting writers on parade as though they were a commodity, a commercial commodity, you know. And as I said, it, it's a bit like a beauty contest, and I disagree with it, I'd say. But maybe I'm wrong. I'm I'm open to be uh, influenced one way or the other. Will you take a look at it anyway? Oh, I will, certainly. Oh, I'll go and see the... John B. has his play, new play coming on, and actually my brother has a play on there, and uh, I'll go in as often as I can, really. I'd like to see those things. Uh, that's not the, what I'm disagreeing with at all. What I'm disagreeing with is uh, bringing people to the place to look at writers rather than the stuff that they actually write, you know. Uh, I don't see why I should go in. If, uh, if I had written a play, say, for instance, I wouldn't mind it being put on there, but I don't see what I have to do with it, it's the work that counts as far as I'm concerned. Oldest and most traditional fair, so old and traditional that no one is too sure when it first started, though they'll tell you quite a few tales in Kilorglan, that it first started about 200 BC among the legendary Fianna, or that the goat became famous when a forebear warned the town of Kilorglan, that the dreaded Oliver Cromwell was on his way to attack. There are thousands of people here from all levels of life and from many parts including Americans, Britons, Germans and from all over Ireland. Itinerants gather here traditionally and the travelling salesmen ply their wares. This is a special advertising out. Somebody said to me earlier on, how did I come to the conclusion that they were the prices? Well, if you look in the magazine here, you will see the recommended retail prices yourself. The pubs are open from 6am to 3am and as they say in Kerry, sure most people at Puck don't bother to sleep at all for the three days of the fair. The fair itself is the main business, or it's supposed to be. Horses were first sold, but prices were quite high. And in fact, some British buyers were disappointed. They said the prices were far too high to buy. Cattle and sheep followed. Among the buyers and sellers are mountainy men not seen in town hardly from one year to another, and many sharp-eyed dealers looking for a quick bargain. Of course, though, the goat is the centre of the event. He's king for the fair, and they say here in Kilorglan he's a symbol of virility. Whatever about that, for three days, he'll be displayed above the town of Kilorglan. Just before the crowning, the man whose family traditionally scar the hills of Kerry every year, looking for a suitably virile specimen, told me that this year King Puck took a lot of catching. This was the most difficult year, almost to date. Uh, Easter Monday, a party of 34 left Kilorglan town, including some of the mountaineerings, and even though they got very close to the goat, they really failed to 
bring her back to Killarland town. Well, I, whose family have been doing the thing for num almost a century, we went out later on in the week and we brought back the goat, back to Killarland. What happens to the goat after the fair? Oh, the goat is left back to his, back to the home, back to his uh, uh, mountains again. At the traditional home of uh, King Puck, of course, is the Cadden Tool Mountains. I'd like to stress that there's no cruelty whatsoever involved in this goat. He's well looked after and well fed. His feet are not even tethered, only while he's being hoisted. And is he quite safe up here on the oh, platform? Quite safe. I'd say to look down at the crowd and see the thousands, he'd be the happiest animal, a person around uh, Killarney for the three days. And it's Jimmy Keenan for Kerry on his own 21. Alan Larkin feeling it despite the breezy condition of the ball. A fair Fair to fair shoulder, no doubt. Brian Mullins in possession. And the first score of the game, a point by Brian Mullins. Kevin Heffernan delighted with that one. Mick Ryan likes so. Likewise, here it is again. Did he come through with it? And over the bar, the first score of the game, a point for Dublin, and scored by Brian Mullins after less than two minutes of play. Cody O'Mahony with his usual good kick out. Mickey Sullivan. And the referee penalizes Dublin for a foul on Mickey Sullivan as he kicked the ball. And this free will be taken by Mikey Sheehy from about 40 yards out. And this will be the equalizer. Breezy ball against the wind. Keith, who seemed to have moved out a bit, uh, was only to take that pass as he sent it to Paddy Lynch. And here comes Kerry again. Mickey Sullivan going racing through. Alan Larkin's in front of him. He's got past Alan Larkin. Paddy Riley's after him. Georgie Wilson's after him. Everybody's after him. He's well and truly looked after now. He's down, and uh, it is another photo finish as to whether it's a free or a penalty. Here's how it happened. He's going, still going through. And he is eventually, he's tripped, he's fouled about three times there. And this free is uh, just about a foot, if it is a foot, outside the 14-yard line. And the game goes on with Brendan Lynch tapping over this point to make it now Kerry seven points. That's one goal and four points for Kerry, three points for Dublin. Gerald Driscoll on with Mickey Sullivan gone off. And this is John O'Keefe, Jimmy Deanahan. Coming out to grab the ball now is Mikey Sheehy. Out towards Ogie Moran. Ogie cutting through the centre. Adam Larkin is after him. John Egan with the ball now. In front of the goal. And it's a goal. Or is it? Yes, it's a goal. It's a goal. Driscoll finishing it to the net, and that is that. Some of the Dublin backs are going that he was inside the parallelogram, but here it is again, coming in. There it is, deflected in, and a fine goal by Gerald Driscoll, and Kerry now lead 2-11 to nine points. We're in the closing minute now. But right now he's a happy man as he makes it carry two goals and 12 points. Dublin, 11 points. And here it is. Mikey Sheehy into Pat Spillane. And over the bar. Game is virtually over. John Egan now with the ball. Into Mikey Sheehy. Back to John Egan. 
John Egan into Brendan Lynch. He's shot and a save by Paddy Collum. Fine save, two good saves by Paddy today. And the game is over. Valencia Radio, okay, thank you, thank you. Listening out now on 2182. Valencia, southwest 4, 11 miles, 1032, falling more slowly. Valencia Island, County Kerry, a piece of land seven miles in length, three miles at the waist. It is the nearest European harbor to America. Internationally, it is known as a communication center. Its wireless station covers shipping across half the Atlantic. It was the European end of the first great transatlantic cable system. Weather forecasters depend on Valencia Observatory for their reports, though the station is now situated just across the water at Car Sabine. Valencia was the most westerly military and naval outpost for the British Empire. At one time, it was thought of as the first transatlantic packet terminal for ocean liners. It was also considered as an international flying boat base. Blue slate from the island's now defunct slate quarries was used in great buildings, including the British House of Commons. Today, the island is probably better known through being the home of Kerry's famous footballer, Mick O'Connell and also through its hectic campaigns for a bridge to the mainland. At its most prosperous time, the population of Valencia was over 3,000. Today, it is less than 700. At the time of the Great Famine in 1847, the island was known as the Granary of Kerry. Its land, sloping to the sun from its high hills, produced the corn which Valencia men ferried across to feed their less fortunate Kerry neighbours. Being fishermen, the islanders managed to escape the worst of the famine, but not the plague that followed. The biggest of the landlords here was the Knight of Kerry, who lived here in the island's most luxurious section, Glen Lean. A group of London geologists visited this estate at the beginning of the 19th century. Sailing in the night of Kerry's yacht, they questioned why the waters of the harbour were still very blue, even in fading sunlight. The answer was the blue slate seabed. For nearly a hundred years afterwards, Valencia slate was the most fashionable building material in the then British Isles. Today, the silent quarry is a grotto, watched over by statues of the Blessed Virgin and St. Bernadette, placed there by the islanders. In its heyday, over 400 men were employed to bore into the mountains of Yokon, the core of which was blue slate. Machinery was imported by sea. A roadway to the quarries was specially built. Rumbling along it day by day was the puffing billy, the steam engine, bringing the huge slabs for fashioning at the slate yards two miles away in the harbour village of Knightstown. By sailing ship, the slate was exported mainly to London. There it was used on such buildings as the National Gallery, the British Museum, and the House of Commons, then being renovated. The shipping of slate brought an impetus to other exports, such as corn and potatoes, and Valencia's fishing industry flourished. The island shops also prospered. Valencia had its own hotel. It had bakeries, butcheries, tailors, stonemasons, dressmakers, shoemakers and tanneries. Soon the Knight of Kerry and local merchants urged that the railway be extended from Killarney to the island harbour. Valencia quarrymen were called in to help. They bored tunnels through the rugged hills on the way to the coast. This viaduct was built across a gap between the mountains. With much jubilation, the first trains were welcomed at Valencia Harbour. But the three-quarter mile barrier of sea remained. The islanders urged that the ferry be bridged. However, England was at this time at war with the Boers. Mafeking, King, rather than Valencia, was to be relieved. The shelving of the bridge plan, together with competition from the quarries in Wales, 
ended the Valencia slate industry. A great many islanders were forced to emigrate. The last century had, however, singled out the island for a major role in world communications. Valencia was chosen as the first European terminus of the great transatlantic cable. The idea of a length of wire crossing beneath the Atlantic was so ambitious as to be somewhat daunting. However, in 1857, work began. In England, the British warship Agamemnon and the American frigate Niagara were fitted out to carry the cable and its paying out equipment. The Niagara soon began laying her cable going westward from Valencia towards Newfoundland. The paying out gear proved faulty. The cable snapped and sank beyond recovery. In 1858, they tried again, having improved the gear. This time, they hit on the idea of having two ships meet in mid-ocean to splice the cable. Then one to go east, the other west. Five times they tried, five times they failed, and were forced to return to port. They were to try again in August of that year, and this time they were successful. Greetings were exchanged in Morse code between the old world and the new. But a month later, contact was lost again. It was to take seven years before financial confidence was restored. Then the biggest ship in the world, Brunel's Great Eastern, was called in to lay the new cable. She too failed, but only once. In 1866, Valencia was again restored as the direct link between Europe and America. For the remaining years of British occupation, up to 250 men were employed by the cable company. The station had been switched from the western end to new quarters near Knightstown. The link with America was vital to Britain during the First World War and the station was under heavy guard. Meanwhile, the Irish Republican movement was preparing for the 1916 Rising. The British were unaware that in their heavily guarded cable station were two brothers with another war on their minds. Tim and Eugene Ring, telegraph operators, were also intelligence officers for the volunteers. They were detailed to keep in touch by the Valencia cable with John Devoy and his Republicans in America. We sent the message through the cable and on orders to the censors to John Devoy, tell him that the rebel had broken out. And the message was, Mother operated unsuccessfully today, signed Catley. And the first news England got of the rebellion in Dublin was from their what, ambassador in New York, asking to deny or confirm that the rebellion was on the Dublin. A oh, short kick out comes to Jimmy Barry Murphy. He must score. Yes, he does. What a disaster for Perry. What a disaster. The goalkeeper caught him and he disgusted with himself. And the court crowd's reacting with ecstasy. Caught him and he taking a short kick out from the small square. Went to kick it short to Jimmy Deenan, but Jimmy Barry Murphy sidestepped into the path of the kick out and then had no bother in planting it in the corner of the net. And here come Cork again, Sean Murphy. Sean Murphy with the kick and now they're four points ahead. Cork, two goals and 11 points. Kerry, two goals and seven. Tom Creed, what a brilliant centre half back he is both today and in the drawing game. Jimmy Barry Murphy nicely caught and then gets round Jimmy Deenan. Barry Murphy point. So pleased with himself, the right corner forward. He's just put Cork six clear points ahead. He's about 16 yards out on the sideline. Oh, what an absolutely brilliant point from a very difficult angle right on the sideline with that sideline kick 16 yards from the end line Juan O'Shea for Kerry passing it to Mike Sheehy 
Mike Sheehy then being pushed at the last moment and it's a free in, it must be a free in. John Maloney giving the free in. Mike Sheehy quickly taken to Sean Walsh and it's off. It's taken off the line. No, it's over the line. The young part is signaling the flag. It's a goal. Yes, it's a goal. Taken off the line by Brian Murphy, but the umpire is quickly in and raises the flag. So now there's only a point between them. Sean, Sean Murphy. John Maloney running in to consult the two umpires. Wants to know what happened. No, oh, it's been disallowed. Some forward was in the square before that free came in from Sean Murphy. Whistles all round the ground, but according to our stopwatch, there's a little over a minute to go. Kerry on the attack again. That's John Coleman stopping the attack. Declan Barron. Jer Paul. Pat Spillan. Pat Spillan putting it over the bar. So now it's just coming up for the last few minutes. And this is Mike Sheaver, Kerry. And it's all over, it's all over. It's all over, and there is just some confusion. Some people think that it's... Le some people think that the scores are level. But some others think that... I would ask the papers to please stay in their seats for one moment, please. Please stay in your seats for one by moment, By four, please. by two points. While we check on the score. That goal, in Thank some you. doubt, the one that Brian Murphy took off the line. So it's level and it looks like extra time. That scoreboard isn't right. Father, the 2 16 to 2 14. Extra time has been played, so the correct score is three goals and 13 points for Kerry. Two goals and 16 points. For Cork. Water horse races in the world. <laughs> not, not all of them come on the water like I do. But uh, they are nevertheless, I think, the last uh, kind of play by of the Western world uh, races that are left in Ireland. Was this, actually, was, this, was this actually where those races are supposed to have taken place? Yeah, they did. Every year. They actually started, oh, way back at the beginning of the century and went on until 1924. 1924, they had a famous fracas here. And... Uh, the committee were fined eighty pounds for unlawful or riotous assembly. Over a race meeting. Over a race meeting, yes. Well, of course, these are not a legal race meeting. This is a flapper meeting. Yes. You know, everybody, it's catches, cam, anybody can ride. There are two confined races, confined to the locality, and then there are probably four open races. And uh, fellows come from as near as Cork, Donegal. They come from the north of Ireland. There's always been a tradition for keeping ponies and horses down in South Kerry, and I think the fellows down here were always. Uh, they always were anxious to kind of match up their ponies and horses against the best in the country. Mm. Are there um, prizes worth talking about at, at oh these? Oh, God, yes. One of the races here now is worth £100 to the winner. It's worth £100 overall. 75 to the winner and the rest of the stake money is divided up then between second and third. Yeah. It's one of the old style events of Kerry, a tourist attraction if you like to call it that, but one that has been here for a long time, one that people don't want to lose. Mm. Mm. It's, it's known as the pipe opener before Puck, and the kind of the hangover after the Killarney races. Really? Yeah, because it always occurs the first week in August or the last week in July, just before Puck Fair, yeah, yeah. and people get into the right mood. The Dingle Regatta would be on the same time as well, Yeah. and well, come on here. Well, surely it's a mov movable feast on account of the tides. And oh, my God, it is, yeah. You have to kind of catch it halfway tight going out and halfway tight coming in, yeah. otherwise the lads are left riding in the water. That happens quite a lot, too. Have you any idea why they started here? I suppose because the, 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 the beach was so nice and level, you know? Yes. And uh, there's a great, there's a natural bank there for, for people to stand on and see all the racing. And uh, I suppose it, it, it's really because of the, the nice level stretch of strand and the fact that anybody can get a fair gallop on it. Mm.
And the proximity to Killarney went through that all the gap ponies would come down here at some stage. Shoot them on, shoot them on. Here I let right. free Judy. Feed them on the right. Shoot them on the right. Eileen is a five of the wind, 50 shillings. <laughs> On a fine day, the mountains and reeks of Kerry can look inviting. You'd be a fool, of course, to tackle some of these shaly-sided peaks unless you knew something about rock climbing. But a gentle walk through the hills might seem a good idea to the unwary. But mountains are killers, and the Kerry mountain ranges have an unenviable reputation for taking lives. I believe that in the coming year that we would have tragic accidents on these mountains. And that's why the Kerry Mountain Rescue Team was formed not many years ago, to seek and find the bodies of the unlucky, to search out and rescue the more fortunate, the ones who stray away but manage to survive. Port Falta, for example, won't have any money for us before 1973. And we simply can say to people, don't get killed or don't get hurt between now and then. You must respect the mountains, for if you don't, you can get into trouble very quickly never happens to them, it always happens to somebody else. And by risking your life on a mountainside, you put the lives of others at risk too. The men, and sometimes women, who voluntarily get a search going. He should have a map and compass and know how to use it, or else get somebody local who can guide him, and he should never go out on his own. The majority of the Kerry Mountain Rescue Team are members of the Lown Mountaineering Club based on Kilorglan. They're veterans now, and until quite recently, they've been the best equipped rescue team in the country. They even have a second-hand military truck to get their rescue teams quickly into action. The trouble is, though, that now the tires on that truck are so bald that they daren't take it out onto the road, and other and quite expensive equipment also needs to be replaced. Radios, stretchers, even a field kitchen are necessities. But if there was an emergency on the mountain tomorrow, the truck couldn't carry them. And the team, looking like Muldoon's picnic, would have to get to their base as best they could. But to replace worn out equipment needs money. And officially the rescue team has no source of income. Three years ago, the local regional tourism organisation gave them £100. Since then, nothing. And to exist at all, the team has to beg for money outside local churches. 
Now, they're not looking for pay. They want nothing for themselves. But they do feel that in an area where it's the tourists who take the risks, that tourist interests should cough up. We'd spend about £200 keeping our truck going and £100 on expenses, food and equipment and that. And where does all this money come from, your, your running costs? We have to collect it whatever way we can. We do everything from fancy dresses to garden fates and dances and beg some of it. And now you've got the church collections going? We have church collections, yeah. yeah. Paddy, you've arrived at a stage now, virtually, where you need money pretty desperately. If we don't get money now, uh, we're quite liable to uh, go out of business because uh, from our own personal contributions, we can't afford the type of outlay that is required. The case that you're making is that some of the costs, at least, should come from uh, tourist interests. Definitely. Uh, we believe this, and we have always believed this, because most of the people who are uh, involved, uh, by this I mean most of the people that we've had to go out and search for our rescue, have always been in the tourist category. They have come here as tourists, and they've gone mountain walking, and they've either got lost or got hurt, and we've had to go out and meet them. So we believe that uh, the tourist people should come along and help us. Well, in actual fact, Sean, in the early days of the club, the, the local regional tourist organisation did help you, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they gave us a hundred pounds, uh, but that was spent straight away on a stretcher. And they did make the point at the time that there was no reason why we should give our time and have to collect money as well, but still we've had nothing since then. You've approached them since then? We have, yeah. One of the local papers that I saw in referring to this whole business said that the, the tourist interests had snubbed the mountain rescue team. Is this putting things a bit strongly? Mm, it probably is putting it a bit strongly, but, um, you know, I, we tried the hotels in the early days and we got very little from them. You, you definitely feel the money should come from tourist interests? We do. We feel this quite strongly. What about local authorities? After all, you're a voluntary group doing a job which has to be done by somebody. We are trying the local authorities at the moment, but their answer has been in the past that there is no way in which they can pay us money, that there's no statutory instrument, there's no act that would allow them to pay money for mountain rescue. Sean, in, in other countries where there are mountaineers, Wales, say, Scotland, mm. how are rescue teams financed there? What's the setup there? Well, in Wales, it's mainly RAF work because they are always aware of the possibility of planes crashing in the mountains, so they look after it in Wales. In Scotland, it's a police responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, the local authorities pay the police there, and the police reimburse any voluntary workers their expenses. Now, quite obviously, it seems to me, Paddy, that there must be a fund of goodwill towards you people and the work you're doing. I know that's not going to buy you any new equipment or anything like that, but suppose you didn't exist, or through lack of funds, went out of existence. What would then have to happen here? Well, people that we may otherwise be in a position to rescue may not be rescued. Students obviously believed in the old maxim that the early bird catches the big business worm. They lined up at Farron 4 Airport this morning to catch the 7.30 in their bid to boost the county's commercial image. There are about 6,000 industrial jobs in Kerry at the moment and it's planned to increase this figure to around the 8,000 mark over the next four years. The service, every Tuesday and Thursday, will operate for an initial 13-week period using an Air Aran twin-engined Islander. Local companies have guaranteed to take up three-quarters of the seats, and the airline says the plane, a 10-seater, will be based full-time at Farron 4, ready for charter to fly tourists over the Ring of Kerry or to bring seafood to France. The flight time, an hour and 15 minutes, is designed to link up with connections to Britain and have executives back home the same night. They will also be able to catch business flights to the continent. A minibus will ferry passengers from Dublin Airport to the city centre. The return fare is £40 compared to 14 for a day return on the train. So, why should Kerry businessmen fly rather than go by rail? Well, in order to have a full day's business in Dublin, it's necessary to stay overnight. And if you couple the, the cost of the hotel, the overnight hotel, and add it to the train fare, you'll find that, that the balance is on par. And I think the reason, 
the reason uh, Kerrymen will use this is that they can get up and down on the one day and conduct a full day's business. And what do you think the new service will be to the county as a whole? It's a very important uh, service to the county uh, from the business point of view and from the tourist point of view. And uh, it's, it's a great addition to the existing in, in, infrastructure that exists at present. Well, there have been other scheduled services between Kerry and Dublin. They didn't catch on. Why do you when did this pilgrimage begin? Oh, this pilgrimage commenced right at the time of the Tohoji Danans and was practiced by every known people that came along after that. This place here was known as, and has been written as, the Great Pagan Festival. It originated in paganism, but as we grew, we incorporated better into it. We're here now in the city at the moment, Dan. Has it changed much since its inception, do you think? And it has fallen down a good bit. The centuries were naturally bound to have an effect on it. The principal thing is that for the 70 centuries, people have come and gone here. You start at what is known as the gap here. Certain prayers are said there, and then it's up to an individual themselves to say what prayers they like, going around the outside of the wall, of the outer wall, three times. And then they come in and say other prayers inside, in the circle, in the car. And uh, there are various stations marked with crosses. I think in pagan times, these marks were circles. And there's one of them still to be seen here, on one of these stones. The circle is still to be seen. Well, would you say that the ritual has changed very much from the early days, even though it's now Christian? Uh, well, the time, anyhow, is the same. The only difference May being that, yeah, May day, that we have 12 days now instead of the original one because of the change in the calendar. People still preferred to pay their rounds here on the old May day, so it grew into a 12-day pilgrimage, May 1 to May 12. So the only difference is that people say Christian prayers? That's it now, yes. Well, of course, there is another two. Uh, around... Wars had an effect on it, naturally. How do you mean? Well, people come in there. You see, when transport took over, people came from far away here. And there were various games played, etc., etc. And uh, we come up to 1939, the last great war, and that had a very upsetting effect on the place. As a matter of fact, it finished the aspect other than the religious side of it. I, this sporting event, the dancing, that died away. In former times, the dancing was done in a field close by here, known as Phil Dennis's field. And uh, time pushed on, and I suppose we got a bit modernized, and there was a dance hall built close by. That had an awful upsetting effect, naturally. <laughs> They came from Cork City here, May Day, with their, all their games and all the rest of it. The place would be thronged with people. And you, you could hear jesters and jugglers and all the voices mixed together. Harp players. This was a great place for harps. And a lot of old relics have been dug up, found around the place. Harp tuning, keys, various other things. Into a tent we straight we went, I'm telling you no white lies. With cakes and sweets she did me treat, with sea grass and bull's eyes. Each hour in treasure size 
my head and the whiskey spilling free and I was fed with barley bread by my morning almacree. We're here in the city and we're here in County Kerry and there's no fish shops here in County Kerry or in the city we're all holy people as you see there down over below look there's all holiness we're all holy I'm a holy man myself but on the first of May, for about three years, or four maybe, a man used to call to me, you know, coming to the city now with him push boys. And when he'd come over to the city, I, I don't know now whether he said around or whether he said prayers or not, I, I couldn't tell you, sir. But he went over and he went across the valley into my house. And of course, I being so generous, I gave him a cup of tea and was delighted because on May Day here we always appreciate everybody and to the kind of a, an annual holiday now if you like and when he had the, his tea finished he went home and when I went out to the to, to where I kept my my cows now for milking and you know livestock and young stock and all I found this little bag in it was sandwiches that was the first year he came now and then big got in about three months I lost a young little, you know, uh, one of my stock, a young one. The second year came and I lost another one. He came again and he was coming every year for about three years. The following year went and he came again and the same thing happened and I lost another little animal again. It could vary now, you know, from six months to two years. Accidentally, accidentally, pure accidentally now. In fact, Jesus, I wouldn't fall maybe three feet and i get him thrown there and I, and it was a case of do away with him. And it's been done for four or five years. But anyway, the local woman said to me, you have a very bad lodger. And I decided then, with other information from other people, that I'd lock up. And I did. I locked up. And from that day until the today, I've never lost an animal since. There was this aspect of leaving various things behind us. They would leave hairpins, ribbons, handkerchiefs, or coins. This was a pagan aspect of the thing. They were uh, leaving their troubles behind them, I presume. When I came here in the Duncan chair, to my round here, and I had a stick, they had limp me around. They left the stick here after me, and that knee never troubled me since. If a person had a, a sick cow, he drove her in here on May Eve, let her there overnight, in the hope that she'd be cured tomorrow. She often was, they claim. The new milk, they spilled that on the door to the byre and the doorway to the dwelling for the prevention from these people crossing over the doorway and taking with them the profit of the person's farm for the coming year. On May morning, the well was a place that had to be guarded because these people who practiced this art, if they got to the well and skimmed the water, they could take the profit of somebody's property for that year. And uh, the prevention was they laid flowers, white horn, golden cups around the well.